Vice-president Michael Ashwin Adin heeft op donderdag 26 september namens president Desiree Delano Bouterse de 74ste Algemene Vergadering van de Verenigde Naties in New York toegesproken. De VP gaf namens het Surinaams staatshoofd de visie van ons land op verschillende actuele vraagstukken in de wereld. Zo liet hij net als overige sprekers onder meer zijn licht schijnen op de klimaatverandering. Ik heb great plezier in welcoming the Vice President of the Republic of Suriname and I invite him to address the General Assembly. Your Excellency Tijani Mohamed Bande, President of the General Assembly, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Mr. President, on behalf of His Excellency, Desiree Delano Bouterse, President of the Republic of Suriname. I extend to you sincere congratulations on your ex-election to preside over this 74th session of the United Nations General Assembly. I also take the opportunity to acknowledge Her Excellency Maria Fernanda Espinosa Garces for her skillful leadership of the previous session and wish her well in her future endeavors. Mr. President, diversity characterizes Suriname. This diversity is also manifest regarding the environment. Suriname is identified as the most forested country on the planet, committed to preserve 93% of our forest cover. Suriname is also recognized as the most carbon negative country alongside Bhutan. Suriname has a unique biodiversity. In 1998, we were the first country that's reserved for scientific and conservation purposes as a gift to humanity. 11% of our land mass, that is 1.6 million hectares of our territory an ambitious contribution also for that time. Mr. President, one can therefore understand that from our perspective, Suriname is, as many here today, deeply concerned about the effects of our changing global climate. Appropriately, we show solidarity with the government and the people of the Bahamas, as well as with others affected by the recent hurricanes. Once again, parts of a small Caribbean nation were wiped out. Is it a coincidence that within less than three years, several Caribbean countries have been struck by the strongest category hurricanes, or is it a time-telling phenomenon that climate change has already become a fact of life with its devastating effects? Mr. President, I wholeheartedly agree with the Secretary General regarding climate change when he says that now is the time for action and not for empty speeches and promises. It is in this spirit that Suriname initiated and hosted the first high-level meeting for high forest cover, low deforestation HFLD countries in February 2019, because since 2007, HFLD developing countries have received under 2 billion US dollars in climate finance, less than 14% of all climate funds committed. At this conference, the CRUTU of Paramaribo Joint Declaration on HFLD Climate Finance Mobilization was adopted representing the collective interest of 27 participating developing countries, and these HFLD countries committed to take action and increase their access to climate finance to maintain their intact forests. Suriname is now mandated by this group to lead the HFLD developing countries in achieving the joint objectives as expressed in the Paramaribo Declaration. And so, we call for a strong ambition 
and more action towards global mitigation and adaptation efforts, especially access to finance. Mr. President, the report by the Secretary General on the work of the organization underlines the worrying picture of the present state of world affairs concerning peace and security. Mr. President, stating that diversity characterizes Suriname also refers to Suriname having a population harboring at least seven major world cultures. The message from our national anthem is strong and clear. Once ope tata komopo, we museti kondrebung. Meaning, wherever you may have come from, we must build a prosperous nation. This has inspired us as a diverse people to advance towards a prosperous nation and has prevented inter-ethnic clashes as Suriname is renowned for its harmony and tolerance, respect for all religions and cultures and for peaceful coexistence among its citizens. But also regionally, Suriname has always propagated and contributed to maintaining the Caribbean and the South American region as a zone of peace. Mr. President, at the regional level, we are confronted with tensions, entailing mistrust among states, which for decades have been enjoying excellent political, economic, social, and diplomatic relations. In the Latin American and Caribbean region, countries for long periods of time have endeavored to preserve and promote peace, security, political stability, and social and political inclusion. Hence, Suriname reiterates the critical importance of respect for the principles of non-intervention and non-interference in the internal affairs of states and underscores the relevance of the process of dialogue, diplomacy, peaceful resolutions of conflicts, as well as political and economic cooperation as building blocks for durable stability, peace, and democracy. In this regard, let me mention seven notable points. Firstly, we applaud the recent steps taken by parties at the national level in the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela to reach common ground through meaningful dialogue. Secondly, Mr. President, our colonial past has also presented Suriname with unresolved border issues at the western and eastern part of our territory. It is our conviction that we will find a solution to secure our territorial integrity in the near future. Suriname is intentionally chosen the path of dialogue to resolve these remnants of our colonial past. Mr. President, thirdly, dealing with the land rights of our indigenous and tribal communities, we have developed a roadmap aimed at legal recognition of these land rights within a Surinamese context. In response to the recent forest fires in the Amazon region, Suriname joined and welcomed the Letitia Pact as a call to preserve and sustainably develop this region. Here, we emphasized clearly the inclusiveness of all Amazonian countries as part of a living Amazon that compel us and these countries to rise above political differences, organize relevant provisions to secure the development of indigenous as well as the tribal communities, and uphold the sovereignty of countries and the sovereignty of the Amazon as a region. In doing so, we will continue utilizing the provisions under the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization, ACTO. Mr. President, we consider the ongoing trade disputes among major international players a serious challenge with far-reaching consequences for our local economies as well. In the same vein, we strongly oppose blacklisting 
and the arbitrary seizure of funds without due regard to the severe consequences to the economic stability of countries. These unwelcome actions remain major obstacles beyond the control of many nations. An atmosphere of trust and political will is crucial and should lead to dialogue and cooperation. Comparably, by the same token, we strongly disapprove of the continuation of the more than a half century old economic, financial, and commercial embargo against the sister Republic of Cuba and its people. Repeatedly, the vast majority of nations have taken a stance against this embargo. One may wonder if it's now, finally, not the time to understand that the continuation of these measures have been and will remain counterproductive. Lastly, Mr. President, with our extensive open borders and sparsely inhabited hinterland, Suriname is a victim of the trans-border illicit drug trade. The recent adoption of the National Drug Master Plan 2019-2023 is a testimony to our resolve to combat this illicit trade. An important component in this plan is international cooperation. Bearing this in mind, Suriname co-chaired the bi-regional partnership between the EU and CELAC on coordination and cooperation mechanisms on drugs, resulting in the adoption of a document that contains the necessary guidelines on the fight against illicit drug trafficking and drug-related transnational crime. Mr. President, concerning the youth, we all are witnessing today how young people are voicing their concerns with regard to their future, and they have the right to do so. As lead head of for youth in the Caribbean community, Suriname strongly advocates for youth involvement as a prerequisite for sustainable development. Suriname has made a deliberate choice to meet that expectation. We pride ourselves in our intergenerational approach that provides opportunities for youth to engage and participate at all levels of decision making. Here today, youth are an integral part of the Surinamese delegation as well. Mr. President, threats and propositions in achieving the goals of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development have been the topic of concern. Every member state has their own challenges. In this regard, Suriname notes the economic stagnation that has come as a consequence of the fast and steep decline in world market prices of crude oil and gold from 2013 to 2015. Thus, significantly diminishing the foreign currency earnings of the Surinamese economy. And in response, the government executed a homegrown reform program. Homegrown because this government is cognizant of the fact that our main asset for development is our people. In 2010, President Bouterse envisioned and commenced a social contract with the people of Suriname. Universal health care, general pension, minimum hourly wage, access to affordable housing, and education are the main components of this social contract. That is, government, and that this government admits, amidst the economic crisis, continued to uphold. Today, in record time, the economy is recovering steadily with positive growth already in two consecutive years, 2017 and 2018, while inflation has come down from double digits to a single and still falling. Since mid last year, inflation has dipped below 5% annually. Exports and imports are both much stronger than during the crisis years. Secondly, I must mention, Mr. President, an obstacle still unresolved and if not addressed, will make the achievement of the SDGs practically unattainable. 
and that is our classification as a middle-income country. Like many other developing countries, including the Caribbean, this classification is based on GDP per capita only and does not reflect our vulnerabilities. We strongly reject this unrealistic classification, which disregards the full set of challenges that we face and which could be addressed with urgency, should be addressed with urgency. Access to concessional financing for our development is critical to allow for accelerated implementation of the 2030 Agenda. Thirdly, is our newest endeavor and priority in realizing the SDGs, namely the strengthening of our National Planning Institute. This institute has been extending its reach to all bodies of government and applying result-based management to our annual plan and annual budget and will be instrumental in realizing a long-term strategy for development. The strengthening of this core planning institute will greatly help in our challenge to collect, analyze, and deliver reliable data and statistics, and this will surely enhance the responsiveness in our decision-making, including the implementation of the 2030 Agenda, and therefore has become one of our highest priorities. In closing, Mr. President, living in a world characterized by the urgent need to cooperate in order to, res to solve the many serious issues, Suriname is convinced that the United Nations remains the most important organization to address all matters confronting the international community, aimed at finding solutions and taking into consideration the interests of all member states. It is essential, therefore, that the United Nations become a more effective multilateral institution with adequate resources and fit for purpose to confront the challenges ahead. Suriname recognizes the eminent role that the United Nations can fulfill in ensuring lasting development and peace. It is up to us as member states to make this work. Mr. President, we can make this work. I thank you. Thank you.